Hello everyone and welcome to This Nintendo Life episode 193. My name is NBZ uh, and Bally has a fun fact apparently. Uh, so Bally, do you want to go ahead with your fun fact? I was going to save it for our Paper Mario discussion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a fun fact relating to uh, the show or something <laughs> happening right now. So I was just like, why don't I just ask you straight away? No, this is a, this is perfect. Now everyone wants to know what the fun fact is. And well, here's the thing, Bal. This is a really in. good teaser and a good way to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Next time on the show, we're going to be talking about Paper Mario, uh, the original on N64. So everyone can go on out there and uh, keep playing it. We're both around the same point in the game, around I'd say a third of the way through, maybe just over a third, and uh, both enjoying it a lot and we will be talking about it in full in a backlog club discussion next time on the show which is two weeks that gives you two weeks to send in your emails send in your thoughts hop on discord chat with us over there uh, i've been uh, talking about it a bit in our discord and it's been cool um so check that out and send us stuff where can they send it to bally please send your emails to this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com and obviously yes post in the discord thread um good use of the spoiler tags from yourself yes. and that is that's something that i have useful. learned quite a lot from my book uh discords that i'm in where they uh use spoiler tags voraciously and i was like oh this is quite fun uh, and a good way to have discussions and not risk anybody uh seeing something if they don't want to see it which is good and um, so nice so yes uh, we will be chatting Paper Mario. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to the fun fact that Bali will definitely tell us <laughs> when that happens. Uh, Bali, how have you been doing otherwise? Oh, I'm good. Just um, moving weddings is fun. Yeah. That's a fun, that's a fun thing. Second time you've moved a wedding in uh, two years. Uh, not great times for weddings, as I'm sure everyone will be aware of. Uh, but you'll get there in the end, Bali. We'll get there. Uh, Okay. At the end, one day, at the end of one of these shows, you'll be thanking your wife, Caroline, and not your fiance <laughs> anymore. And it will have gone through all three stages of Pokemon evolution. Uh, exactly. And that will be a all fun three. thing to do. So, uh, But we'll get there, I'm sure, and uh, in good time. But we're here to talk about video games. Can you believe it? A video game show talking about video games? Nonsense, truly. Um, so, uh, Bali, what are we going to talk about today? For the first segment, we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing. The second segment, we've got a couple of your emails. And then for the third segment, we're going to talk about both the news that Nintendo will be at E3 and also have a little discussion around what games would we like to see ported to Switch if we assume that the Switch Pro will come out. So sort of with that yeah. added power, what do we want to see on the system? Absolutely. Um, so looking forward to that. And uh Whatever E3 will be this year, who the fuck knows? Will Jeff Keighley murder E3? My one hope is I I couldn't care less whether it's a stage presentation or a stream. Agreed. But what I what what I didn't like about last year in in like now that we're here in 2021, I just hated the fact it went on the whole of summer. I love the idea of just five days of streams every day with lots of news announcements and stick to those five days don't try and do too much outside and that would be my preference i think yeah the condensed nature was always nice um and i think part of it is like some of those things like the ubisoft one is like well they did like two of these ubisoft things and both of them felt kind of limp and yeah like, and xbox was like know. we're gonna have a, a thing a month and then it was like one of them was decent the other one was awful and it's just like just put it all together. Give us yeah. the best bits. So that's what we want at E3. We want the totally. best stuff, not everything. Yeah. I agree. Um, but we'll get more into that when we talk about it. Let's kick things off, though, with video games. And Bali, I'm taking the front seat this time. I'm starting okay. things off. Um, uh, we got sent, we both of us got sent uh, codes for Cozy Grove, uh, a game which is out on Switch now. Um, unfortunately, they didn't send us Switch codes because I'm assuming there just weren't any available. Um, I have it on PC. Bally uh, has an Xbox code and I have played a little bit of this so far. Um, I would like to get deeper into it, but it is an interesting game in that it is... It's kind of a daily chore game, like Animal Crossing, where you can do a bunch of things and then it's like, okay, we've kind of run out of things for you to do now. Come back tomorrow and play another half an hour. Um, and I think it will fit really nicely into a routine of like, you know, at lunchtime playing it for half an hour or after work for half an hour, or whatever. Um, like I did a lot with Hades when, when that was out and just doing a run a day type of thing. And um, it is adorable looking art style like beautiful gorgeous visuals uh, and you're this little character who is a spirit scout 
And it's this weird fusion, I, I say, like Spirit Farer and Animal Crossing, where you're on this island and you're talking to these spirits. They they're all bears, but they're all like different types of bears. They're all kind of like square and weirdly shaped, um, and they have tasks that they give you, and you go around the island doing those. So it's like okay i need the the feathers and there are feathers scattered around the island and your inventory will have a, a little thing that tells you where the feathers are um, or like gives you clues basically to where it, it'll be like oh i think i remember seeing it by a furnace and you'll be like ah, oh, i know where that is go and find it so you're not just scouring the island for every nook and cranny to find these things because one i think one of my com early complaints is that it's a little hard to see objects because there's a lot of detail on this island loads of different kind of um little things on the grass and the ground and and it kind of gets mixed in and one of the issues is that because when you're giving objects to these characters they're basically filling in the world with color and so when you start off the world is kind of like white and doesn't have any saturation to it and so distinguishing what you can interact with and what you can't is kind of tricky because the objects that you can interact with kind of blend into the background and you're not sure mm. what is what a little bit so so i'm sure that's something um that will get addressed as i get further in because the island will get more and more filled with color and therefore it will be much more easy to distinguish things but you know similar to a lot of these types of games you, you get a pickaxe you get a shovel you know you can hit rocks and get ore you can dig up holes you can fish uh, the fishing uh, it seems pretty neat and it has a there's uh, one uh, music selection uh, one song so far that is really chill and super nice and i really really enjoy it has kind of spirit fair vibes to it but like has its own identity as well and uh, does it have like a story and a goal is it more similar to yeah, spirit fair in that sense or is it more totally. a bit open-ended like animal crossing yeah it's it's much more directed you have basically the main characters this this kind of uh, pile of logs uh in the center of your camp and you have to feed him logs in order to grow the fire he's he's a little fire essentially and you're feeding him spirit logs in order to make the fire bigger and that introduces new characters and each character has five hearts above their head and every time you do a task for them the heart will slightly fill up and so i imagine that you need to max out their hearts and then that you go through their story or whatever and um and kind to see what's happening there so far the story isn't super heavy it's it's more like you're on this island you're a spirit scout you've been sent there by this person and you're kind of just talking to all these spirits and and bringing them uh they they have these ghostly forms but then when you do a task for them they kind of transform and look more real like they fill in and they have colors just like everything else so i'm not sure if like they are becoming alive again or something i'm not really sure what's going on there but they they do change what they look like um there's also a giant fox who's the merchant and is just like one of the most adorable things i've seen um very like weird blocky squares as i mentioned for these characters but, but your character is just a, like a little uh kind of almost animal crossing-esque style character but the, the art style is gorgeous the visually just super appealing um and uh yeah i don't have a huge amount to say about it so far because i've only done two days or so uh with it and you basically run out of like once you have done the tasks and got the logs for the day the fire will be like ah oh, I, I don't sense any more logs are available come back tomorrow but you can do your own crafting stuff there is a crafting guy and i made a bunch of little poles that you can put around like a fencing almost around your campsite so i started making that um, and you can make other materials and objects and and things to put down to kind of customize the island and you know kind of make it your own in some senses so it doesn't um, feel like there's any time pressure at all it's very relaxed no definitely not no it's it's really relaxed it's, it's a very chill game um super super cozy as its name uh, obviously uh, says but uh but yeah it's um it's one that i think i need another couple of weeks to play every day and see what the the loop is like because at the moment it's not that it's not mechanically interesting it's kind of just like walk around the island pick things up give them to people uh and apparently this studio started on mobile games so i, I wonder how far this goes and like whether it does have a bit more depth to it um or if it is just kind of a, t a tick box game in some senses with some really nice like charm around it and some really nice um, aesthetics uh, what i will warn people of is that uh, I was also sent a PS4 code, and uh, that was not good on PS4 in terms of its frame rate, uh, hitching a lot, like really lagging at, at points where. So when the bears like turn everything coloured, it um, it does hitch a little bit and will load because it's. And even though it's not an action game, this was really bad. Yeah, like 
I wouldn't say unplayable, but it's just really, for me personally, as someone who doesn't like inconsistent frame rates, just distracting to my experience. Okay. Um, and even on PC, I, I have this PC now, and there's like 144 frames on my monitor, and I'm looking at it, and it says it's 144 FPS, but looking at the screen, there's some weird movement or blurriness or something going on some hitching it feels stuttery when i move around the island and i have no idea what the reason for that is i posted in their official discord about it and a couple of other people mentioned they were having the same issue so it's weird it's the similar across ps4 so what i'm saying for the switch version is be aware of that because if ps4 is having that problem switch is a less powerful piece of hardware it's probably having a bunch of those issues as well i think it is a little buggy right now so i'd probably wait to see if they fix that stuff but um uh, it's it's also got a launch discount on Switch at the moment. It's it's nine pounds something, ten percent off I think. So if you love Animal Crossing, if you if you want something chill that is beautiful to look at, has a really nice uh, relaxing soundtrack that you can just play a little bit a day, um, I would I would say check it out. Um, but yes, I will give you better thoughts next time once I have fully uh, immersed myself into it. And I'm sure Bally, you'll check it out as well, mm, and uh, yeah. we can we can talk about it a bit more. Um, the other thing I picked up on sale on Switch was. The fourth entry in the Box Boy series. You thought he was dead. Bye bye, Box Boy. Pretty definitive, right? End of a trilogy. We're saying bye bye to Box Boy, but no, he's back. Box Boy plus Box Girl uh, obviously came out, I think, a couple of years ago. And uh, we're both big Box Boy fans. I think I am maybe a little bigger than you are in terms of I don't mind just going back and playing another one of these games. I think you got burned out by the second one a bit. Got a little bit um, burned, but uh, I think the first game was really long. And then the second yeah. one. I had a good gap between them, but I think that second game just, it plays with the formula a bit, but maybe not enough that made me kind of to reignite that fire that I had for the first game. I don't know. Totally. I think the first game was just such a unique and innovative idea and Very so cool, clever, yeah. really smart. And I still think just one of the best ideas of small games that have come out of Nintendo. It's probably my favorite small franchise that Nintendo makes. Um, and this game, obviously... It's criminal is not an assist trophy in Smash Brothers. Yeah, there is an amiibo, however. QB is an amiibo in Japan. Uh, so I feel like that's the one amiibo I do need to add to my collection is a Box Boy amiibo because <laughs> uh, we love him over here. Um, but yes, uh, Box Boy plus Box Girl, the, the kind of hook of this one, which I unfortunately am not able to try out, um, is that it's got co-op in it, right? So one of you plays as uh, QB and one of you plays as the female is Box. Is there any online co-op? I doubt it no obviously mm. this is nintendo that would be a, a bridge too far for them <laughs> maybe if this had come out you know this year or during covid they might have thought to add it in um because they did do that with 51 worldwide classics which i was pretty shocked by um but they haven't uh if you think it was a result of covid that 51 classics had it or i don't know i i'm not sure with that i i wonder if it was a late decision um just because you know it's a board game thing so you'd assume with nintendo they'd be like well you just get yeah. together in person and play these right i mean the one but, that the the game it the original i guess on ds uh which was 42 all-time classics i want to say yes and that was like i think it launched at the same time as mario kart ds and was the first couple of online ds games at the time was 42 all-time classics online back then yeah yeah is that what you're saying wow yeah. damn okay that's well maybe that's it it was the history of the franchise then in that case probably is the reason as opposed to any other reason that would make more logical sense like covid affecting uh the plans but Yes, uh, I wasn't able to try that, and I would like to at some point. I think it would be fun for us both to do the co-op campaign um, whenever. You know, obviously it would probably take quite a bit of time. Uh, this main campaign took me, I'd say, five six hours or so. So I'd imagine similar kind of length for the co-op mm. one, maybe a bit shorter or longer, depending on how well we would work together. That would that would be good. That's the the mix up in that formula. I need to give it another go. I think. Yeah, for sure, and. Um, and I, I'm really curious to see what those puzzles would be like using two people, because I think you could get really clever with it and um, and do some really neat stuff. But uh, the main campaign uh, is uh, still really great, and I, I had a really fun time doing it. So some of the changes they have made, um, you actually can play as both characters, so you can just press the ZL button and switch between them. And they have the patented costume stuff as well, so if you collect enough... Um, currency whether that be from collecting crowns or completing it in a certain number of boxes then you get that currency and you can spend it on a slot machine which unlocks a bunch of costumes for your characters so like a mohawk or like mummy bandages duck face like all these weird things that make these characters because they're blank slates right kind of like kirby they're just square boxes and so except one of them has a bow on her head to indicate she's a girl um yeah and like swapping between characters like 
bow no bow <laughs> yeah exactly that's the only difference but yes you can customize them a lot more here which is fun um doesn't seem like they did because back i remember when i got the second game they gave me bonus costumes because i had save data from the first game on my 3ds i'm sure nintendo knows i own all three of those games but it doesn't seem like they gave me any bonuses for buying them thanks nintendo um but uh, but yeah so the levels are pretty straightforward for the most part i think generally the difficulty curve is a little easier than previous games in the series um and i think partly it's because they have added in the wrinkle of a number of boxes as a limit so when you enter a level there's obviously the number of crowns that you get and crowns are usually in hard to reach places they're tough to get to they require a bit of um, thought but also now every level has a limit of boxes and depending on how many boxes you use uh it will give you a certain ranking um star rating or whatever and so there's three tiers of that depending on number of boxes and i went for the 100 percent. i did uh limited boxes on every single level which i think it's kind of similar to 3d world and the mario games where you're collecting the green stars right like sure the main game is fun but the real challenge or the real enjoyment of the mechanics comes in going after all those bonus things which is the crowns and which is the limited number of boxes um and so that certainly added a bit to the level of difficulty because i think if i hadn't done that i think this game would have been a little too easy for my taste when it comes to box boy because i do i think as someone who is a uh, uh, let's say veteran of the series um i i know all the tips and tricks you know i know that you can get a box under him to like get him up in the air underneath it and so you can use that to get up higher places while also being on top of boxes i know that you can push boxes out but then take them back into you and it won't have counted as you using them so you can use them to push something and then pull them back into you and that's zero boxes there's actually one level in this game where i beat it using zero boxes because of that trick um right. so so i think because both of us you know we know how this stuff works someone new to the series someone coming into it fresh would probably not have that built-in box boy kind of mechanical knowledge and so they might find it a bit more tricky but for me as someone who has played a ton of this series and really knows how the puzzle design works um it was quite satisfying actually to use that and sometimes to just completely break open puzzles and like beat them in 10 boxes shorter than even the lowest amount that they expect you to do uh which is super fun and like super interesting the ways that you can manipulate it um but but i think the interesting thing about it why it's a bit easier is that the first couple of levels and another weird thing they do um which i'm sure we'll talk about with paper mario as well of like you know the idea that they don't give you a mechanic even though you know how to do it you know like the hook you can do where you put it above your head and then hook onto a thing Mm -hmm. or even um yeah similar things like that where you you move a box to a spot and it sits there and then you press the Y button and it like drags you towards that spot. Like when you're going through thin corridors, both of those mechanics are not allowed to be done by the player until the game has taught you how to do them. So it basically Mm. gives you them as a power as opposed to you doing them early on. Now I haven't gone back to the earlier levels and tried to see if now I can do them with those powers, Um, but it does start off quite simple in that way because they are clearly, it's the Switch, there'll be a new audience who hasn't played the series before they do have to kind of pace it right and introduce it slowly to people but i thought that was a little annoying for me as someone who was like i can just hook up there why don't you let me do the advanced mechanic that i know how to do and that's probably why it's probably because there's new people um but they do give you that stuff eventually and then i'm hooking all over the place um and manipulating one of the things i really like about box boy is the ability to minimize your number of boxes in really sneaky ways by like having a box go almost all the way to the edge and having it just far enough without (laughs) needing to use another box right so it looks like it should fall off but there's like a one pixel where it's still hanging off the edge that you can still go across it and use it um i really like that and that's still very much yeah because it it is a grid system but they it's not completely rigid to that grid like you can still do no you can slide it to wherever you want basically which is really cool yeah and i i love that um but there are some new mechanics introduced in this one um one of them is sand which basically any box that gets pushed into the sand instantly deletes it and so you're kind of making your kind of sneaking your way through the sand it almost feels like um uh like those levels in skyward sword where there's the mole underground and i guess that's not a good example there's there's 
you know, um, Minish Cap's a good example of like the sand dunes with the, the claws, right? And you're clawing through the space. Okay. Um, it kind of has that feel. It's like a maze almost of, you know, y- your boxes will destroy the sand, but you can also sit on top of sand. And so right. it's, it's a case of like not destroying the parts where you need to be on top of, otherwise you'll fall to your death. Um, so that was a cool one. Um, there's also the ability to slam boxes into the ground. And so you can uh, you can make them and there will be switches that are underneath the floor. And then you do a kind of a down slam and QB basically pushes the box underneath the ground and kind of jams it in there. And there's some clever use of that in terms of having it in the side of a wall and having it slowly go down like an elevator as you slam it one level lower each time. And like calculating how many boxes you need to be above there to get it down uh, is really fun and pretty clever. Uh, and so, yeah, the, stuff like that, there's at least... I'd say five or six new mechanics that they introduced throughout the course of the back half of the game. Uh, and there are 16 worlds. So it's it's pretty lengthy in terms of number of levels. I think each level, each um, each world has like between six and eight stages. Um, and I never got too stuck. There was one puzzle where I did look it up online, but also you do have the option, which is nice. I can't remember if they introduced this in the second game or if it was in the first game, but you can spend some of your currency for them to show you a bit of a trick um of like how to get past the next area i think in the first game you could spend um street pass coins if you remember Ah, that was how you could get um uh hints so it wasn't unlimited but it still wasn't too much of a a cost right it it cost you something at least um i do remember that you're right uh that was a that was a cool system say street pass a cool thing that nintendo has now killed <laughs> i'm stuck uh, on my game i'm gonna close this lid and just shake my 3ds for five yeah. <laughs> minutes and then and then spend my coins <laughs> exactly exactly um but yeah the, the i think the nice thing about the hint system is that it, it doesn't give you a hint to get the crowns it only gives you a hint to um get past the next area yeah which is is good and i think it like leaves still the challenge there of getting a crown uh while also not getting you too hung up on it but there were definitely stages of like okay you've got to do this in 10 boxes and i'm like how the fuck do i do that in 10 boxes that seems really really difficult um but they definitely have some clever tricks um and and there's a ways to get around things that uh you know that you will be satisfied when you figure them out um and and so yeah i think overall probably one of the easier box boy games but maybe if you're new to the series that's a good thing right like if you've never played one of these games and you also have a co-op partner you can play with i would totally say pick this up because it is one of my favorite nintendo franchises um obviously at this point quite iterative but still it's one of those games that i can just sit down i was watching min max's like documentary on PopCap, and i just had that on in the background sitting here playing the last few worlds uh, last night and it's just such a chill experience you know because it's it's working on that part of your brain that can still focus on other things while you're still kind of puzzling things out um you know minimal you know music and you know it's obviously very minimal in its visual design um but box boy still a series that i advocate for still a series that i think should get a bit more love from people um Mm. and it's a really nice entry solid entry in the series uh and i'm sure we'll get more it ends on a kind of like ominous uh it's a kind of a weird ending And, and i think part of it is that if you beat all the campaigns because actually when you finish the main campaign you know the tall tall box he's like yeah. uh, a rectangle you unlock a brand new campaign with him and i looked it up and there's like 13 more worlds of him um with his own unique puzzles but as well as the co-op campaign so this is basically three games in one which is pretty cool wow um, right i was about to ask like says so your the campaign you played is completely separate to this tall guy's campaign and the co-op campaign yeah it's a separate thing on the menu it's called a tall tale and it's uh Jeez totally different set of levels with like long boxes you're gonna get back to that at some point you think i think it it depends right if they put out another box boy then probably not but if it's a while until they put another one out i can see myself returning to this and trying out that campaign because i get the itch for it you know i i i I find that this is a series that you know maybe i'll take a little bit of a break from but i always get the itch to come back and just do some puzzles it's it's a really chill uh easy to play game good with the tv on in the background you know um yeah i love it love box boy i would highly recommend Cool, Bally. Uh, we have also been playing a video game that's not Nintendo, but I think is a very Nintendo video game, which is why I want to talk about it on the main show. It Takes Two by Joseph Harris and Hayes Light, um, a game we've been anticipating. We've talked before on the show about Brothers, our love for that game, A Way Out, which we co opted back in the day. Uh, and so here he is with the third entry the third um, from entry. his studio. And uh, Bally, I'll let you open here because you haven't uh, talked much sure. so far. I mean, um, 
I, I definitely think this is a game Nintendo fans would really enjoy. Um, and you're thinking, right, I'm a Nintendo fan. I, why would I enjoy this? And I think it's because Nintendo are good at taking ideas, reinventing ideas, throwing fresh ideas at you. And if you compare it to a game like Super Mario Odyssey, I really genuinely think over a sort of 11 hour period, which is actually the same length as the sort of main campaign of Mario Odyssey, if you're kind of mainlining it. It just constantly throws new ideas, new mechanics at you. It doesn't stick with any mechanics for too long and just constantly throws something new at you. And I think that it's so impressive to see a, a developer that isn't Nintendo do something like that. And that's not really what I would associate with like a haze like game and, you know, Brothers and A Way Out where mechanically those games were good. They were decent, but the 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 thrust of what those games were going for were, was how those mechanics linked to the narrative. And the the narrative links to the mechanics in a very different way between Brothers and A Way Out, I think. But I think it's still a crucial part of how those games operate. And I do think this game, it takes two. It kind of... Yes, the mechanics have a link to the narrative in some aspects, but there's it, it's very minimal. And if you compare it to a game like Brothers or A Way Out, like it's, it's very surprising to me that... This game is actually all about the mechanics and the narrative kind of falls flat in many ways. And it's interesting that that's the the way around this is where I think Joseph Farris, you know, coming from his like film background, wants to be the narrative guy, the guy who can meld video game mechanics to narratives. And yes, I think he did that well with Brothers and A Way Out personally, but... I actually think this is my favorite of the three games and probably marries the two the worst out of all three. Yeah, which it, that is like weird, a, isn't it? It's a traditional video game in that sense, but a really strong co-op experience. Totally. It is. It definitely feels like they went all in on ideas, ideas, ideas for places you go, for things that you do, for ideas that you can take two people and have them be asymmetrical where they're doing two completely different things while still helping each other and communicating in ways that where you need to tell your partner to do this and you need to count down timings and like all that stuff is so expertly thought through and polished and designed and yeah you're right the story is just kind of bad in a lot of ways and also these characters i'm not sure i really like it has a tone problem as well and and i think that is so strange when you think about like the the types of things that he has done before and and the kind of goals that he has but ultimately that stuff just falls really flat i think some of the performances are quite good you know i think the main characters do well with what they are given it's just i don't think what they are given is good in, in any way yeah. and and overall for me when it comes down to it right and we talk about this a lot a game can have an incredible story um and be like fine mechanically and i will always take a game that is has a terrible like i take this game over the last of us part two any fucking day of the week <laughs> even though last of us narrative you know performances vo that shit's amazing but i can also just watch a movie and that's the same right this is a video game I think you're being a bit harsh on the mechanics of last of us too which i think they're, are very but they're good. fine they're they're, they're fine they're totally serviceable i really am not because it's we've seen it before it's stealth it's shooting oh i think they're better than serviceable but we'll have to agree to disagree on that basically. we'll agree to disagree i think like you're shooting your stealth it's video game stuff right and this is also video game stuff but this is creative relentlessly yes. just like yes. so many different ideas and things thrown at the the plate and the wall and all of them kind of land and even if they don't stick they're still not there long enough for you to care enough about it that you get frustrated or anything like that right like there is such a great pace to the way in which it doles things out in terms of places you go things you do um it's really really brilliant and that is you know for me I don't care that the story is bad because I can just ignore it, right? Like, yeah. story is never, like, the main thing I come to in video games. Sure, there are different things that, you know, there are certain games that are just narrative, like I talked about last week, Wide Ocean Big Jacket. I love that game, and it's basically just narrative. But when you are trying to make a video game that is a video game, you know, I don't really care. You know, the story is bad, yeah. so what? I still think this game is tremendous. In many ways, that's why it does feel so much like a Nintendo game, where Nintendo the narrative the story whatever nintendo call it is really in the back seat of the whole thing and it's all about yes. mechanics fresh ideas like we were saying um i would say this game still has a lot of naughty dog aspects to it mainly in its sequences where they just have these really spectacular cinematic uncharted style over the top sequences that on top of the cool innovative mechanics 
are just the, these really fun things to be a part of honestly and, and often at maybe like the end of levels or something but they they go on wild rides in this game and i think they play well with the the whole perspective toy story style thing where you are very small in these very large worlds and i think that that sets itself up well for like a, a sort of naughty dog style sequence where you're falling through the sky and onto the back of this animal and chasing this thing and then then all of a sudden the and I don't want to, we don't want to talk any spoilers because I think all the innovative things you're doing in this game, it's better to talk less about them um, and just experience them for yourself. Right, that's the weird thing. Usually, like, when it comes to mechanics in games, I don't consider that spoilers, but I think because the story in this game is not that much to write home about, like, I don't really care about spoiling that and I don't think yeah, it's exactly. really worth yeah. talking about, honestly, but the mechanics are so surprising and delightful that I just think people should experience them just playing through the game because you'll be like, wait, what? I'm what now? I'm doing what now? You know, like that moment happened so many times throughout the experience of like oh shit we're gonna do this um and it's just exciting it's always exciting yeah. it's always like something that you don't expect um and you know there there's an area later in the game where i'm like oh we kind of did this type of environment before and i'm like well it might be kind of similar and then we go through it and it is just so many cool things that you do in that that space yeah. um and that really just shows to me like yes um you could look at this as you know this kind of like uh, bugs life slash toy story adventure through a house and through all these kind of familiar spaces but they do detach from reality at points and like go into spaces that are a bit more fantastical you know yes. and i think that lends to the game honestly like i think it is stronger for making that decision um because it, it lets them just play with ideas in an even more creative way yeah um, overall so and the game does a fantastic job of as you say not being tied down to this is what a table and chair looks like therefore the geometry of you walking underneath the table and chair has to they, they just go well it, sure but then this links to that and this other crazy world that we're just going to make up and it, as you say it's a fantastical version of a bedroom or a tree mm -hmm. or outdoors or other areas that the game goes to that are entirely fantastical not just fantastical takes on rooms of the house um, yes so yeah. it, it's a really good combination of all those and yeah i uh, my hype for this game was really high and i was it, like playing it through with you in the space of a weekend like we played friday night saturday sunday yeah it's been a while now since we played it because we played it like the week it came out and right. so we did it over those two days just non-stop essentially obviously we took breaks and stuff but um and now i've been moaning to you since that no one else on the internet seems to have beaten the game or those that have don't want to talk about it much because yeah, exa except for us um because i should mention uh, yes. that we were both guests on the game for all show um where we do go into to spoilers there and we do talk in depth about the game quite a bit so if you want to hear more of us talking about it definitely check that yeah. out i'll put that link in listen the description. to what we're saying now um, go play the game and then listen to our spoiler discussion on their podcast because yes it, 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 that'd be a sure. combination because yeah there's just so many mechanics that we dive into that um definitely deserve the light of day and a discussion yes i know we're going to talk about it later in the show but like this is this should come to switch pro right like yes. this is such a yeah it's such a game that fits a nintendo platform the joy cons obviously with two players co-op the split screen yeah. like it feels in every way like a nintendo game but it's not on a nintendo system and it really bums me out did a way out come to switch i don't think it did no Our brothers, brothers did. did um and brothers obviously a much lower powered game right. like a uh, kind of more primitive game in terms of its visuals and aesthetics and stuff like that so it ran better i think or was able to run on the system versus i think part of the issue with these co-op games is having to render these two different spaces because mm. there was a point remember when one of us went into one portal and, and one of us went into the other and we're both rendering two completely different areas and so i think that's quite taxing you know as a video game on a system like switch uh, where I think you would need that boost in power to be able to just achieve stuff like that, having two right. separate things. Because the entire game is played from this perspective of while you're playing, you can see what the other person is doing the whole time. It's a it's as if you are playing local mm. co-op together on a couch, even though it's online. You both see the same yeah. stuff. And that's quite important mechanically. It's not just a, a design choice, as it were. It's, it's useful to yes. know what your partner's doing a lot of the time. Right, because there's times when, like, at the beginning where you jump in a pipe and I have to hold onto the pipe to, like, move it so that you can get shot up to an area or... Uh, you know you're throwing nails and i'm like hammer like flinging myself off them that type of stuff is really 
helpful to see where the other person is and you can just be like oh on your screen this part like over there can you see and so because you have context for the other person's screen it's really easy to communicate that stuff um, yeah yeah so oh god i just remembering back to that friday night where i think we'd finished chapter two and i was just uh-huh. like <laughs> buzzing to like get on to chapter three and the experience because yeah. those first two chapters were just so like the pace is just relentless with this game it's actually crazy like there's sure there's points where you're like oh it's just slower paced and you're you're kind of doing slower paced things but those periods are almost welcome because the rest of the game is just so fast and yeah just insane with the new things it throws at you and yeah the game does a really cool thing where there's a lot of grind rails and the grind rails are just great ways of the game linking you between two points but those grind rails between become like these almost disney world like experiences just to get from point a to b right like there there is a point where you're like going past dinosaurs and i'm like this reminds me of like a ride literally in disney right now um it definitely it has a theme park especially the third chapter to me was like we're basically just going through a theme park this entire chapter and it was awesome yeah that that chapter was really impressive where it just had proper ground up mechanic after proper ground up mechanic like yeah nine times in a row and it, and i had some sections like that i wasn't a huge like there's a there's a boat section that i wasn't a huge fan of but like that doesn't last I, too I like long that doesn't section, overstay its yeah. welcome and um you know then then you're done and and you don't have to do it that, that, that's the thing that's the kind of the mario comparison here is is just like nintendo there's an idea you do it you never do it again and mm. for some parts we were like oh I really would would have liked know, to like one part of... in particular I'm thinking of of like riding a certain thing and I'm like man I wish we did more of that but you don't and that's kind of the joy of it right so yeah yeah and no collectibles the only collectible are mini games yes. which were they vary drastically i think in how fun they are but some of the best mini mm-hmm. games are very fun very cool well designed yeah we did this thing where we basically did best of three we, we made a decision at the start of like okay how much are we going to play these mini games we're like okay let's do best of three for all these mini games i didn't go back and check because it does keep track of who won each one right i haven't actually actually i can't check which i should also say this game has the friends trial friends pass thing which um bali bought it on playstation 5 i played on playstation 4 and i don't actually own the game i just basically access it through his account essentially right um weird weird way it's set up but i don't think i can actually go and check that stuff because all the save data will be on your end not on right, my end right essentially and there's no um, cross play but you can play cross generation like ps4 to ps within the same ecosystem ecosystem yes, yeah. um which is honestly a real shame because I think this game is all about as Joseph Harris wants to share the experience. So it's a real shame they didn't have that crossplay function where everyone can just yeah. play on their, you know, their f- desired system. Um, totally. So hopefully, maybe that's something that, that they introduced down the line. I don't know, and it might come to Switch yeah. at some point. Yeah, that would be good. I think it definitely would help. Um, it would help more people be able to play it with other people if the, you have certain systems and the other people don't. Um, you know, it's um, and it is one of those games that I wouldn't mind playing again from the other perspective because definitely. you play these two characters mm. and you both do different things throughout the game. There was stuff that Bally did where I was like, well, like there's this one boss fight where it is so intense on my end that I am so focused on like jumping and dodging all these lasers, and Bally is doing this entire platforming sequence <laughs> on another area, yeah. and I. Have have no idea what that was like i have no idea what was happening i was constantly like emmy zed look at what i'm doing it's so cool look at you're like i can't yeah. i can't i'm running i'm like I, I literally i have to avoid all these things this is like too intense and so i i've never experienced that i didn't even look at your screen that entire time so that will be totally fresh <laughs> yeah, to me if i right. played it from the other perspective you know yeah um, really cool so. stuff so yeah if you have a pal if you enjoyed mario odyssey and you have a pal who enjoyed mario odyssey you need to get them onto the both of you onto this game because it is just yes. so much fun. And I, it's, I've not played a ton of games that come out this year, but this is going to take some beating when it comes to sort of game of the year lists and stuff. Like it's, it's yeah. really, really impressive. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, it takes two. Check it out. Um, that is going to close us for the first part of the show. Don't go anywhere, however. We'll be back after the break talking about your emails. See you in a bit.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the second segment of today's show. It is time for your emails. If you would like to send an email into the show, please email thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. Or you can post an email question in our emails thread on Discord. Link to that in the description. Join us in the community there. Um, Tim from snowy, snowy Wisconsin posted in our Discord and asks... You guys talked a bit about nostalgia in a recent episode, and I recently li- listened to your old TNL ranks on your top five nostalgic games. A slightly different nostalgia-related question for you this time. What are your most nostalgic music tracks? These are the tracks that just a few notes instantly puts you back to being a kid again. It's hard to limit certain incredible soundtracks to just one song. For me, my top six are the Mineral Town theme from Friends of Mineral Town, Old Dale Town theme from Pokemon Sapphire, the title theme from Metroid Prime, Wind Wind Across the Plains from Fire Emblem 7 Lin's theme, uh, the Endar Spire theme from the beginning of Co- uh, Knights of the Old Republic, mm. and the Super Smash Brothers Melee menu theme. Excited to hear your picks, and as always, thanks for putting on a great show, Tim. Fantastic. Uh, I, I like this question a lot, and uh, it was interesting going back and looking through uh, all these different uh, music tracks to see which ones would trigger the nostalgia kind of senses. Right? There's, I feel like with nostalgia smell is very strong i always cite when me and you went back to our uh, our old school and walked <laughs> into the gym and like the smell of the gym i was like holy shit it's like a rubber floor smell almost yeah or something like it's, but it's yeah. like so iconic and like burned into my like senses that yeah. like going back there and like smell i was like jesus i'm like five years old again it was ridiculous um i think smell is probably the strongest uh, nostalgia um bring up but but music can definitely do that as well in certain ways although it, it it differs and it changes depending on like how much do you listen to that music throughout the rest of your life i was gonna say i think frequency is important and all three that i've picked are songs that i've definitely listened to a lot uh because of the nature of where they are in those games you know okay and not I, I know many people will be like oh nostalgia can relate to a specific m- important moment of a game but for me it's less so about the moment and more about the like number of times you're hearing what's being played basically yes exactly um do you want to kick us off bally what's the first one that you've cool. chosen well my first one is from mario party 4 okay um and it's basically like i don't think the 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 title for this on youtube is a bit off it's it says like yeah it doesn't have an official name on this track but i know oh, from listening to it that it's basically like the the startup music Yes. Um, for when you're starting a party. And it takes me back to just like sitting in living rooms like you, me, Ali T, our friend Murray, Charlie when we were younger, like just booting up a Mario party. And uh-huh. often often it, if we were about to get into like a Mario party, it'd be like, all right, we know this is going to take a few hours or whatever. So often this was the screen that was just playing while others were getting a snack or going to the loo or someone's mum has just dropped you off for this sort of music that's yes. playing just in the background. And totally. It's a very like simple tune, but it's it's just... In, it just like, loops, doesn't it? It, it just, just like, loops keeps over going, and over. Yeah. And like, to be honest, a lot of these classic tunes that I looked up everyone makes like 30 minute loop videos of them on youtube but yeah I think they it's, are yeah it's because people really want that nostalgia i guess and they just want something on in the background that feels nostalgic and nice i guess so yeah it's, it's kind of I'd, I'd call it just like the the getting ready for a party theme or something yeah. in mario party 4 uh, which is our most played mario party by a mile oh by, um, by although ages i did play ages. quite a bit later at uni but that wasn't that was a five and six but yeah mario party four yeah i particularly remember uh, a mario party session at my house on my birthday when i got my gamecube uh because bali came over um everyone came over but bali had brought a bunch of controllers and games but no console and i was like <laughs> wow that's weird <laughs> maybe you should have hidden that somehow but, sure. but then, then it was like awful at like trying to hide it or i just like yeah, yeah. i think your mum was or you know it'd been communicated that i was gonna get a gamecube for my birthday uh <laughs> Uh, and so you just br- bring all your shit around and i'm like hmm there's something smells about this and then i like went into the bedroom and saw it on the bed i was like oh shit i'm getting a gamecube uh, and then obviously we all played um you know 
played a game of Mario Party 4. Great, great hiding spot from your parents, I must say. Like, Amazing, truly. Lying just, on top of the bed. Yeah, genius. I mean, it was just about to be wrapped, so okay. you know, it made sense. Um, but yes, that uh, that happened, and this, yeah, this is a good, this is a good choice. Uh, I, there's lots of, I'm sure, picks you could take from Mario Party 4 that are nostalgic, but this one definitely, um, you know, hits the nostalgia. Because button. regardless of the party that we're about to play, we'd always hear this music because this is the music yes. that plays when you're picking characters and all that. So I thought it was like yes. the most nostalgic. Yeah. Uh, cool. My one, I probably should have reread Tim's email while I was doing this, but um, I chose one that he has chosen, uh, which is the main music uh, from the Super Smash Brothers uh, Melee. Yes. Uh, yeah. And this, again, is one that, for me, Smash Melee is maybe one of the most nostalgic games, generally. Um, but it's it's walking into your living room and seeing it for the first time on the TV and like that music and how many hours we spent unlocking characters yeah. and like going through menus, like, you know, doing target practice and adventure mode and all those different things. But this music, there's something about it that is just so iconic and like there's an epic undertone to it, but then it like has calming moments through it throughout as well. And it's not, I wouldn't say it's your traditional menu music really. Um, but it's it's burned into my brain like just sessions of like when i hear this i just think about sitting in your front living room playing this mm. game um that's like where my body is just like located when the when this is, uh, track but, plays. but a bit like the mario party 4 track we just played it's kind of like because it's the menu music it's just sitting there it's always going yes it's like if someone's being dropped off by a mum or a parent you know it's like the music that's just on in the background uh -huh. or while someone's off doing something else so yeah you just end up listening to it so much more totally i feel like there's a home video or something somewhere with like this music playing <laughs> yeah. as we're sitting there you know um yeah. if, I, I can also like, hear it through the vhs like noise you know um because it is is that iconic and um yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to really say about it, but like Smash Melee, of course, one of my most nostalgic games. I can't remember. Thing is, I didn't actually go back and check what we had chosen on that episode for our most nostalgic games. So maybe I'm crossing over a ton here with the choices I've picked. But that tends to be the case I find with like games you're nostalgic for. The music will also be burned into you um, in this in a similar way. So yeah, that that makes sense. Right. Um, my next pick is from Mario Tennis on the N64. Okay. And it's basically... So the, the tennis just... The, the tennis. The, the music just loops while you're playing a match. So right. in the early tournaments, um, or just any tournament, no matter how late you are in the game, actually, the first round song is always the same. And it's just like this... It's almost like just this like warming up kind of exciting. You're now in a tennis tournament and you're playing and it's Mario Tennis and it's all very exciting. It sounds very boppy. Like yeah, it sounds really high energy actually. It's you know? really high energy and it's just it's really hard to describe. It's very eighties, it's very nineties, but it just sounds so bopping and just gets you in the mood for like Mario Tennis on the N sixty four. And it's one of, if not my favourite, like Mario Sports song and because it's always the, the song that plays when you enter that round one of any tournament. It's, again, it's repeated. You'll hear it a lot of times, right? right? Just because right. you're going to be doing a lot of... Did, I mean, you're very good at this game, right? So I imagine you usually got past round one quite easily. But um, yeah. if I was to ever play this, I imagine, you know, <laughs> you know, this would have been the only song I ever heard in the game, right? Because I'm just not very good at Mario right, Tennis. Right. Uh, but, yeah. Um, I don't remember this one listening to it now. Um, it um, doesn't really clock on my radar but there is something familiar about it because i'm i'm sure i would have heard this uh, at your house having played mario tennis with you slash against you slash never won a single game in my life well but. we normally play for 15 minutes and then it's all right bally bally's won let's play another game kind of yeah yeah pretty much that tended to be how <laughs> same with f0 same with wave race you know, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that, that was the way of it um <laughs> That's that's a fun pick though. I I wouldn't have thought of that one, and that's definitely more specific to you. Um, yeah. So so Mario Tennis N64. Uh, cool. Uh, my next one. I mean, everyone will be familiar with it. It's a, it's a bona fide classic. Um, it is of course Escape from the City from Sonic Adventure. Oh, what a tune! Um, like the the opening, just like ding 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 ding. You know, um, it is it's a classic, right? And it is the cheesy pop that sonic is known for right like they're just absolutely over the top corniness um but this one at that age like we were kind of getting into this wasn't like this was pre-guitar hero 3 era right mm. but i think we were still kind of into 
Um, probably a bit more poppy stuff when we were a bit younger. This was versus. our favourite rock song before we even knew we were into rock. <laughs> sure, music. yeah, in some ways. I don't, would we classify this as a rock now? I don't know if I would. It's very poppy. Um, yeah. It's got a great hook to it, of course. Pop rock, Lyrics as well. Yeah. I just remember that level so distinctly where you are running through a city that looks like San Francisco with the hills and eventually the truck comes around the corner and you're running towards the camera. It turns into Crash Bandicoot, doesn't it? Crash Bandicoot style, right. And just, I think it's like the first level of the game, perhaps, if not the first few. And yeah, because, I mean, I was... Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was actually quite a difficult game so i ended up yeah. playing those first few levels a lot more on top of the fact that the chow gardens would encourage you to play levels over to get the animals to charge up your chow right because so. when you killed enemies they would turn into animals that you then collect and you yeah. feed them so that you could breed your chows so this was one of my favorite levels to go back and just play over and over again um because it was just a great tune to listen to but also yeah. an easy level to get through and look i remember through. another stage that was by the docks i think we did a lot uh, i can't remember i think that was a sonic level as well but it was like by a docks and it was kind of similar in vibe to this but obviously uh had a lot more uh animals and the things you could collect so but yes this uh it's also weird because it's got lyrics, right? And I don't think we saw that very much when we were younger in, in our video games. Like, songs with lyrics was not... Right, we weren't playing GTA and stuff like that. No. Obviously, played it at friends' houses, but, you know, real music that was coming through a radio being sung by someone wasn't that common. And so, like, having a, a song that was literally a song being sung uh, was, I think, a bit unique and kind of made it stand out. I don't know if there are any other lyric songs in Sonic Adventure 2, because uh, I seem to remember a lot of the rest was just regular music there might be one lyric song per game at least maybe because uh, like sonic heroes has its own song that I, I love um and then there's some others i've not played a ton of sonic games to be honest but yeah yeah, yeah. i think they all at least have one or two yeah anyway great great track uh, escape from the city i'm sure everybody knows it it's even if you never played that game there's something about it culturally that i think has like passed through anyone who didn't even play that game and everyone knows escape from yeah. the city right like yeah uh, iconic awesome cool. game right my n- probably my number one um is the intro song to pokemon snap on the n64 now okay. this, pokemon snap was my first ever console game and uh, like i bought a second hand nintendo 64 around the year 2000 when pokemon snap came out uh, and got this game in and around its launch and it was my first ever experience of a video game console and i absolutely love pokemon Snap. it's probably my i think it was my number one most nostalgic game in that list i can't remember yeah but i am obviously really hyped for new pokemon snap and this song it's just the intro music and it's very suggestive about like you know this is pokemon out in the wild and it's like misty and just kind of and you're in a forest and then mew pops out of nowhere and you're, the character you play as todd just kind of looks around quickly tries to snap mew and then mew flies away before you can say anything and like that's the intro and then the music comes back in to be like right yep you thought you saw mew but now we're back to just the nature of pokemon and it's very it's very calming and just and it's it's tranquil. like um Bubba Riley is that the name of that song or something? Bubba Riley kind of, uh, by the Who. Yes, I think it has that kind of feel to it. Yes, good, good comparison. Yeah, it does yeah. sound like that with the um, what, what's what, what's the name of that um, it's like plucky strings or something. I don't know. Right, I don't. Is it a harp or something or is it piano? I'm not sure what it is, but if, I mean, to me it's it definitely just synthesized. Like but it sounds similar yeah. to like harp, harpsichord, or piano or something. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's just the but, way that that music comes in. The little mew kind of interaction happens, and then the music goes back to this tranquil kind of suggestive. Mm. But, but it was just like this is Pokemon for the first time in 3D, and I just so. Not like not the first time because there's already already Pokemon Stadium, but Pokemon in the wild, I should say, in 3D. Like it felt mm-hmm. like a really big deal at the time, and this music just sort of summarised that entirely. Nice, yeah, very very low key, um, but yeah, I imagine you know booting this game up a bunch that probably gets seared into your brain as well, yes. right? Yeah, um, so. again, yeah, the intro song, so you're hearing it loads, um, yes. which is is always good for sure. 
um my final pick is uh is one that you know i think also will be quite obvious but uh is is just seared into my mind it is the athletic theme from super mario land 2 on game boy um, and as soon as you hear this it's just like yeah i'm back i'm i am i'm eight years old um i'm in london at my cousin's house he's handed me the game boy i've turned it on i'm like this is amazing this thing is huge in my hands obviously because i'm like eight and i can't hold it but oh my goodness this is a mario game there are those weird strawberries with um fucking s- oh, knives in their head, head which is not actually what they are they're jason masks but i didn't know that um and uh yeah and this song was like very early on in the game so you hear it pretty frequently especially when i was younger and not very good at platformers playing this level a bunch over and over again because it was the easiest level and i could get through it easily and you know they had those weird like underground sections in that first level where you could fall through the hole and there'd be the spiky ball guys who kind of looked like poo walking around um that was definitely uh, a big part of my memories when i was younger of, of handheld gaming even though i never owned this game when i was younger i bought it for the first time on 3ds virtual console when it came out but this is a great theme um and bopping and has a mario vibe to it with also like sounding quite different from a lot of other mario music i don't know what you think about the soundtrack in general for mario land 2 but it has there is something a little bit different to it than your regular mario um kind of soundtrack I mean, the first Mario Land was also very strange in its own, in almost its own way. So I think the two Game Boy games have always gone down, both aesthetically but also musically, as just the the the, the odd ones in the pack, I guess. Um, yeah, they're their yeah, own they, entities. Definitely, they definitely still stand out quite a lot, I'd say, especially in comparison to. I mean, what was the the next handheld Mario game after this? Because I know it went to, into Wario Land, which is different. Yeah. But it then did. I think so the next um, original one was the new s- series on DS. I think you're because right. Because they yes. did all the remakes on GBA. So like, totally. It, when we think of oh yeah, handheld Mario has always been weird. It's like well, there's not really always been a handheld Mario to even compare it to. So when totally. Think, like, yeah. It, yeah, it's always been weird because the the last original one before the DS one was in 1992. Yeah, um, which exactly. is wild. It's crazy, um, but a great nostalgic track one that always just puts me right but i just think about playing that old game boy in my hand every time i hear this um so transports you you know like nothing else does Um, nothing like a bit of nostalgic music absolutely love it love it love it um great that was a great question thanks tim for that um good to walk down memory lane uh, every once in a while um so appreciate it our next email is from Matria, who is from the UK. It says, Hi, I'm Zed and Bally. What would you say are your top three Nintendo consoles in terms of their respective gaming libraries? I wanted to ask this partly as I was interested to hear your takes, but also as the Switch has so many great indie and third-party titles, as well as several very strong entries in Nintendo's core IPs. I was wondering if it's already Nintendo's strongest game library to date. For some clarification, backwards compatibility doesn't count. Uh, just so certain consoles are... Uh, invalidated and whether you include handheld systems is up to you i think the ds would definitely make up my top three but adding all those systems in could make this a little too long of a discussion thanks matria so uh yeah i think you also added another uh thing to your restrictions bali aside from um yeah i i basically said i'm not counting virtual consoles or remakes or like this is only original games to come to these systems is what i counted okay cool um and yeah i hmm, i don't think i necessarily did that but i i think that it probably will would work out the same way either way whether i did that or not i mean um, the, the console i think of that i think excels in the in the remake slash virtual console that isn't in my top three i should say out the gate is probably the wii u where i mm-hmm. just think that we've talked before on the show that it's the it's the console that i probably spent the most time with in the first four or five years of this podcast between both original games which of course there are some great ones but also just a, a host of virtual console games and we're even playing you know paper mario right now on we're the using console. our wii u at the moment exactly you know? so it doesn't make my top three but it's a worth a yes shot. totally yeah I agree, I agree with that and i think maybe a bit disingenuous to say the wii u is one of the top three libraries when like <laughs> frankly it was some slim pickings back in the day you know? <laughs> or at least like one game a year for yeah. yeah it may be number one in our hearts but let's oh, yeah. be real let's be realistic about it um it's always gonna have a special place on this nintendo life that's... yeah for, for sure uh, it's probably like the console of this podcast i would say um 
but uh switch for me is just it's unquestionably like in the top three even at this point you know i think that it's only going to get better it's only potentially and we'll talk about this in the third segment get more support when it comes to uh, an iteration of it being more powerful and allowing for that but you just look at the variety on the store whether that be stuff like collections that capcom is doing or you know weird arcade things um or like these old things that are being done in a different way to virtual console but the number of independent games that are just first on switch or just on switch plus pc when they launch um nintendo support for it from a first party perspective the third party partners that they have with bethesda and um and even blizzard hopping on board with like diablo and overwatch and stuff like that which are three being on that like there's an absurd number of games that are even in the modern context like very must play games um alongside weird stuff like old gamecube games like tie the tasmanian tiger or like tomba or like all these weird uh, deep cuts that you know i remember reading about in magazines when i was younger on gamecube but they just decided to just put them out right like uh fucking turok from n64 is just <laughs> on there you know yeah. it's wild uh the amount and the depth and the breadth of the category uh, um catalog on switch at the current moment uh, and i know obviously a lot of that what i'm saying is stuff that you have um revoked from uh, eligibility i think even with the revocation uh of of my my hard and hard rules uh switch is number one for me like yeah. i think that it, it's the quality of its first party output combined with just the sheer number of quality in the games and those third party partners i think is a really strong combination um that beats the rest for me yeah i think it's it's one of those things when the thing was about to launch and we were kind of skeptical about its library i remember that first year of like i bought mighty gun vault burst because there wasn't really much else on the eShop to buy <laughs> and like man i wish in that first year it had had the richness of the library that it does now because i was playing so much switch in that first year um and there was a point in the summer like after breath of the wild had come out and stuff and i didn't want to rebuy mario kart uh, and those arms which we played a, a bit of but i i, I really wished for a, a richer indie library and Golf now Story i just was that first year as well remember it was but it was later right it was like august or september or something yeah. versus like the mid-summer time when i was like looking for something to play and now i just can't keep the fuck up right like <laughs> you, you're like oh is that on switch and you just assume yes it is and it's not even a question anymore i used to be a question of like oh cool this is coming to switch now it's like that's not coming to switch what like that's it's weird well we were so used with wii u just having to wait for months or often pointlessly for games that were already out on other systems that we know that wii u could handle but for just you know publishing reasons and other deal reasons it just would take ages to come to that system whereas it's almost always day and date switch and like you said probably the pc yeah exactly like the it's mostly day one for for all these games and all the big games that will be coming out um in the independent space are going to have switch as their kind of primary console platform for the most part right all the smaller enough ones um that that work on the system but um but yeah i don't know i mean there's you, we talk about the system all the time it's the modern nintendo show right now where this is the modern console that everyone's playing so i don't think we need to go much more in depth than that but i just think the quality and the breadth of the library is just kind of unmatched um in nintendo's history really yeah. um yeah. at this point so yes uh bally what about uh your your next one uh my number well, i've ranked these three two one oh, so okay my, num my number one is the switch uh we've already talked about that my number two uh or shall we go three first so i go for I, two well, I don't mind whatever but you want to do i'll go for my number two the, my number two is the nintendo gamecube um I hmm. think that it's, as a Nintendo fan, you often fall into the trap of like, oh, I just wish there was another F-Zero, or I wish there was another Wave Race. It's like, well, GameCube's got both, and that was the last time it appeared, you know? Like, yeah. it's, uh, on top of the fact that it's got an incredible Zelda, a fan it's like two fantastic Metroid Prime games, and an equally as good <laughs> Mario game that I, mm. I think mm. I, I personally enjoy a lot i think the, the the nintendo gamecube has a really strong first party library even if it was at a time when third parties were taking off perhaps more so on other systems i think gamecube was arguably the last 
remnant of third parties holding on a bit to like publishing across the three consoles um i'm thinking of games like uh beyond good and evil right that was across the three Mm -hmm. um stuff like resident evil was on gamecube right so like not that these are games i've played or care about re4 was exclusive for a time until you know it wasn't and now re4 is like on every platform imaginable but um yeah yeah, i mean soul Calibur is the one i think of instantly of like the three different versions the three different characters right um yeah that was that was definitely kind of representative of that generation which was ps2 is just fucking shitting all over these other two guys and these other two guys are kind of in a bit of a neck and neck race but xbox is slightly ahead of gamecube but like yeah ps2 just left those other two consoles in the dirt uh, yeah. but publishers did still support the other two to what extent you know ever was needed or allowed um yeah so. and I, I think that when when you hear nintendo fans or or fake nintendo fans being mm-hmm. like nintendo just don't have any games anymore it's like i think those people harken back the most arguably to the gamecube era where once the wii came out and people were like we need some games for the gamers you know it's like they were often referencing gamecube games you know that gamecube library uh, that was so strong obviously super smash brothers melee we talked about before like uh-huh. there's, there's a host of great gamecube games mario kart double dash um you know like that was a solid entry of almost every nintendo uh first party ip that you think of off the top of your head that the gamecube had a strong showing for uh and i don't think there's it even had a console pokemon game right even a console um, pokemon game and i honestly don't think there's a ton of nintendo systems where you can argue that it covers such a wide array of um nintendo first parties um obviously totally. it, was the, it was the start of a series like pikmin as well like it was really important um at the time i mean if you want to count battalion wars that's kind of right? advanced wars yeah. adjacent you know now we're, we're covering all our bases that's why i think for a nintendo list it's stellar the gamecube um, path of radiance man one of the best fire path emblem games radiance. so um really want some ability to play these games in the future because i think we said it before but sure there's a handful of new play control games that are available uh, on top of like wind waker being remade um but other, and you know sunshine appearing in the 3d all-stars collection but like it's really hard to access those other gamecube games so i'd love to see them come in some form in the future yeah i agree um yeah when you first said gamecube i was like mm, i don't know if it's uh, that big but like it is true that that first party stuff they did really have like even animal crossing right it's launched right. um or started in the west on gamecube they um they had covered loads of different bases and uh yes and they still had enough third party support so despite the fact that gamecube as a financial system was a little bit of a failure for them i think for people who played games it was pretty rich as a library goes um, yeah and some pretty great stuff there so uh i my next one i haven't really ordered them but my next one is uh, the ds um and the ds is one of those that i think at the time when i was playing it and buying games for it i wouldn't necessarily have said this but in the years since um you know getting an ace card and like hacking and getting a bunch of like roms for ds games and just trying out the breadth of that category when i was younger um was an eye-opening experience to just how diverse the lineup is for this system and it's not just nintendo doing their own things with their franchises and, and having first party stuff i think in some ways the nintendo stuff on ds is maybe not the strongest stuff on there there is third parties were fucking killing it on ds you know from capcom with phoenix Wright to konami with the three castlevania games to other visual novels like 999 you even had grand theft Auto, chinatown wars on there um like a diversity and a breadth of library including a bunch of rpgs like remakes of all the dragon quest games um a bunch of final fantasy remakes they remade final fantasy 3 and 4 um like loads of stuff like that that for an rpg person is definitely going to be appealing right even things like radiant historia that came at the end of the life cycle mm. um the remake of chrono trigger there's it's just for that type of game the ds was a really kind of golden age of um of, of video games when in that period of time like the ps3 360 wii 
you know, RPGs had kind of taken a back seat and, and Japan had also kind of taken a back seat. And so Japan was really kicking all of its ass on the handheld front, which was on DS and uh, and putting out all those different types of games. And, you know, even when I look at my library for DS, it's just such a diversity in types of experience. You know, you go from Layton to Picross to Mario Kart, you know, to Animal Crossing. Um, the world ends with you. Like, what even the fuck is that? It's just, it's so many different types and varieties of games using the platform in unique ways um the touch screen obviously being just such a a revolution for it and um and yeah i think overall it is a platform that i have grown more fond of over the years uh as well as just i think it's its cachet has increased and like it's one of those consoles i always want to go back to and revisit and find weird deep cuts because there are a lot of amazing deep cuts on ds um that can be just glossed over you know yeah Uh, i think i was even more guilty than you of at the time i played almost solely the sort of nintendo first party stuff and then uh, well the the nintendo first party the stuff was also predominantly like the the what what, what, what's that series of games called the new play cut touch yes what is it called um the it's it was touch generations touch generations right so your nintendo your brain trainings your brain uh big brain academy that those sorts of games but you're right i i watched a a nintendo life not to be confused with this nintendo Uh video (laughs) on youtube recently and top 21 games on nintendo ds and it was almost entirely RPGs and visual novels. And like, it is just stack, chock-a-block full of quality games in those genres, which at the time I just wasn't into at all. Mm-hmm. And still need to try out more visual novels and RPGs, to be honest. So like, you're right, it's a, it's a great system to go back to. It's just something that at the time, in the moment, I just wasn't on, on board with that train in the same way. Yeah, the types of games we were playing were just kind of different to, I think, what our tastes have evolved into now, right. especially especially me. Like, for me, it's a system that, you know, I went back and played all of those Castlevania DS games. Uh, I intend to go back and do all the Dragon Quest remakes. Did you know that Way Forward made Contra 4 on DS? Literally, wow. Contra 4 is on DS and was made by Way Forward, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's shit like that that I'm like, what? I had no idea that that had happened at the time. They even did Final Fantasy Tactics uh, A2, like a sequel to the Advance game. Um, Kirby Canvas Curse, we always mention. Elite Beat Agents, a weird, like, quirky game that was amazing. There's a Rhythm Heaven on DS. There's fucking Scribble Nought, Sonic Rush, like, Mario and Luigi RPGs, two of them. In two fact. Advance, Advance Wars, Wars games. Wars games. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> the Spirit Tracks and, and Phantom Hourglass, uh, you know, it's just fucking Murderer's Row of video Mario games. Kart DS yeah exactly the first ever um, mario kart to a have a mission mode but b uh bring back retro tracks first and last in fact to have a mission first mode. And last, but it was the first to bring back retro tracks which are still like a mainstay in every single mario kart since which i think is very important absolutely yes i think the ds the the trouble with the ds right is like putting its games on newer platforms is hard because of the way those yeah. were made with the two screens and everything they kind of did a amalgamation for it on wii u where like the gamepad was the bottom screen and the you know tv was the top screen and i don't know and to their credit with that you had like four different options where on you like, did you yes could, you could move the screens about or play both screens on the wii u gamepad on its side for example it was mm-hmm. cool yeah for sure um so yes the nintendo ds uh, number one in our hearts um Bally, what's the next one for you uh my number three is the nintendo 3ds um yeah. it, i think the 3ds deserves a lot of credit for taking some of the more jrpg visual novel ideas that were predom- predominant on the nintendo ds but then throwing those in with some more traditional console types of games a bit like your pilot wings resort for example like i think it does a great job of bringing together nintendo first parties back in their stride and i'm also thinking of games like link between worlds you know metroid samus returns like Mm -hmm. traditional styles of games but really good entries in those games and then reinventing the genre in a a case like mario 3d land um but on top of you know strong jrpgs all of those fire emblem games there's so many on 3ds oh my god so like Um, yeah because the uh, fates was three games basically (laughs) so it's like accounting for a bunch is technically five altogether i guess if you count those three but right jesus man um and yeah, it's stuff like Super Smash Brothers on the 3DS, you know? It's just... Yeah, man. Like, I always forget that Smash was on 3DS, but we played fucking loads of that game on 3DS. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. 
Um, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I played Yokai Watch for the first time on 3DS, trying out that series and what that was like, and that was really interesting, like a, a thing that I don't think I would have tried before. Um, I would. There's, the thing with 3DS for me actually is like as going back to old games and like things like that. Um, it's the system that I have the most like uh, kind of check boxes of. I need to go buy this and buy this and buy this and buy this before they shut down the store inevitably, <laughs> right. like they've done with the Vita. Like I need to make sure I have a copy of Tom and Archie Life at some point, or Monster Hunter Stories, or um, Ever Oasis, or Fantasy Life. Like all these weird, like smaller third party games that I was interested in at the time, but wasn't interested enough to buy it back then. But now that they are potentially going to disappear and historically I won't get to play them again because, again, similar to DS, the 3DS is a weird system that's hard to, you know, replicate and emulate. Um, mm-hmm. I want to cover those bases and make sure I have, I have access to those games. Um, so, yeah, it's it's definitely a really good one. And, and it's also uh, got some really strong indies. Not like the same plethora as the Switch, but games like, you know, I guess Box Boy's not really an indie, but games like... Um, it counts, I would say. It counts, you know. I guess. Gum and Clive, you know, Pushmo, Pool Blocks, whatever you want to yeah. call it. Um, there's like a lot of strong. I played games. VVV VVV on 3DS, VVV, VVV, and that's VVV, one of my favorite VVV. 3DS games. You know, exactly. Yeah. Um, some really good indies on there, just to complement the, the the very strong first party uh, showing, which is awesome. Yeah, fantastic. It's yeah, I there are so many 3DS games. Just I need to. I have a reminder. Do not forget about the Guild Zero One and Guild Zero Two <laughs> games. Buy those at some point. I must do those. Uh, yes, I have. I do have a list on Google Drive of like here are the 3DS games you must buy before the Nintendo inevitably murders it in cold blood. Um, so have to set aside a couple hundred quid to just go through and buy everything I need from 3DS at some point. Mm. Uh, but I'm keeping my eye out. I actually, there was that Atlas sale that happened a couple of years ago where I bought Radiant Historia, Etrian Odyssey 5, and uh, Seventh Dragon for like five quid each. And that was an incredible sale. And I hope they do some more of those, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, so I'm going to keep my eye out for 3DS sales potentially. But nice. only going to get harder as time goes on. Um, uh, my last one, is an interesting one. I don't think uh, we would necessarily think about this, but um, I'm going to say Super Nintendo is oh, my wow. third. I thought you were going to go Game Boy Advance, but Super Nintendo is very strong too. That the Game Boy Advance is great, um, and I do love the Game Boy Advance, but I think Super Nintendo for me has been one of those that I, none, none of us grew up with. Um, we had ex- some exposure to it through Virtual Console on Wii and then through Wii U, but I think without fail super nintendo games are games that i can pick up and try and always have a good time with no matter what they are right um and and looking at the switch current like lineup of virtual quote unquote virtual console with their switch online service there's a ton of weird super nintendo games that are on there that i have picked up randomly and been like what's this game where you're a firefighter and you're putting out fires or like uh, super valus that i played earlier this year or even like you know prehistoric man is on there that i want to go and play and none of these games are like incredible or amazing but they're all such weird unique ideas because it was in that era when video games were trying to figure themselves out right and so you have this variety of stuff that is trying new ideas and kind of maybe failing in some aspects but also being very interesting alongside just some of the best games ever made right like bona fide classics um games that still and will always hold up just because they have a classic timeless look um and you know the the rpgs alone make this system stand out above uh, from the rest right between earthbound chrono trigger final fantasy 6 um you could throw final fantasy 4 in there even though i haven't played it you know it is it's like those are top tier like some of the best games ever made um right. so so that alone kind of gives it a, a big standing but i really like super mario world and i think it's one of those games it's that got a very strong zelda metroid mario entries yes of course three. yeah totally and, and i mean I might not think link to the past is like my kind of zelda game um because it is less puzzle focused and more actiony um mm. but it's still a beautiful game and i have I will admit, like, I have restarted Link to the Past and Super Metroid on those Switch Online services and played through them, like, a few hours each. And I just don't tend to do that with other games. And I think there's there's an ease of pick-up-and-play with Super Nintendo games that no other system really has um and and some of it is like familiarity like if you've played those games before they're just easy to be like oh yeah i know what to do here and i'm just gonna wander around and play it um but but yeah i think overall it is a um 
uh, fantastic system that has a bunch of undiscovered stuff still for myself that I would like to go back to uh, and, I think and, and mine its depth. Nintendo have been incredibly generous when it comes to like accessibility to a lot of their Super Nintendo games. And what I mean by that is you can play them on Wii, you can play them on Wii U. They did the SNES Classic with a decent lineup. And sure, yeah. there's loads of SNES games that you can't access through these means. And that's a real shame that they, they're arguably lost to history. Uh, but then with the SNES Online on top of that, which is doing some deeper cuts, like we have been pretty blessed generally, I think, when it comes to playing Super Nintendo games, especially when it comes to the classics. So that regardless of the fact that we've not grown up with the Super Nintendo, we've had easy access to Super Metroid, Link to the Past, F-Zero, Earthbound for most of our lives, really, <laughs> Like, uh, which totally, I think is... Yeah very good um for us as nintendo gamers who who where we've now experienced most of those um classics you know right and it's a bit of a shame i think for some younger players who didn't grow up with n64 or gamecube and then exactly. they're kind of shit out yeah. of luck right now in terms of accessing those games so totally that's a shame and i think nintendo really needs to fix that but um but yeah, Super Nintendo uh, continues to be great. Like, you know, I think about when we played Wild Guns last year online, and that was awesome. Like, so what a fun. weird hidden yeah. gem. We played Contra, like, fucking great. So many amazing experiences to be had on Super Nintendo. So, yeah. 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 We'll play Mario RPG later this year. So that's yes, we will be. We, yes. That's one, one of the best SNES games we've not played yet. So Totally, yeah. To yeah. But yeah, Matraya, thank you very much for that email. I think that was a really fun discussion. Um, if you would like to send an email into our show, please email thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com or post a comment in our Discord server. Link to that in the description. It's a great community we've got going on over there. That's what we've got time for the second segment. Join us in the third segment where we're going to be discussing some games we'd like to see come to the Switch Pro and a little bit of Nintendo at E3 news. We will be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back to the third and final part of the show. It's time to talk about some stuff. Uh, Bally, what's the stuff we're talking about? Nintendo's coming to E3. E3, you say? That doesn't exist anymore. What are you talking about, Bally? What's going on? It's digital this year, I guess. They kind of just... I believe they've actually changed the name of it to entertainment. the Electronic Entertainment Experience is actually what they have done, which is, uh, hmm, I don't know. I mean, it's not an expo, of course, because no one's going to any uh, big convention center. It's, it's expo in and of itself quite an American like idea and word anyway. I think like so. A, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, what is expo short for? Is it short for anything or is it just I, a word that means... I don't know. Like, I uh, just associate it with like... The World's Fair in like 1940s, and I don't know. Yes, exactly what I was thinking of. The World's Fair, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, E3 uh, trying to claw its way back into any kind of relevance. Uh, ESA is saying that they have basically partnered with a bunch of um, uh, big names uh, who you know ha we have seen at past E3s, such as Xbox, such as Nintendo. Um, and it's not everybody. Obviously, Sony and EA are missing from this list, as they have been for the past couple of years anyway, and they will inevitably do their own things, whether that's tied into Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Festival, whatever the hell he's going to do. Um, who knows? I'm not sure. Um, but it i i do wonder what e3 even means the, these days like what because the whole point of it was people going there to play games in one space i guess the the benefit of it is condensing all of these uh potential shows these potential announcements into a shorter time span so that it's all concentrated at once right yeah and when i think about it for a company from their perspective with this digital stuff i don't know how much sense it makes for them to do that outside of 
just having a few more eyes on them, right? Like, if, if Nintendo has jumped into E3, they inevitably probably get more eyes on them than if they just do their own direct, you know, separate from whatever E3 is. Yeah, or maybe they don't. Theory. Maybe Nintendo are bigger at, at this point that they don't need that. Who knows? But Yeah, it's inter- I would like to know, like, is there any viewership bump by being under this E3 label or not? And Or, or, or do Nintendo just go with it as part of goodwill? You know, like... Wh- yeah, like... E3 is a big is still the biggest gaming you know thing in the world. Therefore, surely one of the biggest developers in the world should be at that thing. Do they want? Are they interested at all in the idea that you know what this is actually good for the industry, not just for us? Yeah, it's it's weird and, and it's hard to figure out. I think because last year a lot of things got announced, but they just got announced separately and in a way that was a bit disjointed and didn't really come together. And I think part of it was you know people like ubisoft for example who did their own thing i don't think they probably got as much traction on those videos especially because they were like here's one and then we'll do another one later and the first one was so shit that i'm sure that the viewership dropped off drastically for the second one right so in that case or a company like them i think it benefits them to be at something like this um Mm. versus nintendo where you know, the fucking world was on fire talking about that Nintendo Direct when it came out, right? Like, it seems like they have the eyes they need anyway. Do they need E3? I don't think so, frankly. But um, no. but maybe it's just nice. Maybe it is just nice for them to be there and be a part of all these other things happening. I, I like to think that they, they arguably, as much as they are a faceless corporation, um, are interested in the overall health of the industry and still see E3 as a valuable channel to promote games not just for them but especially for smaller developers yeah maybe it is that thing of like the new york times will write about us if we are at e3 and they won't otherwise but yeah but even then like you look at places like the washington post and they have launcher which is their own video game vertical now right like a lot of these places even those big magazines have their own video game editor or person beat reporter who is covering that stuff for that publication anyway um and so i'm sure that like the nintendo direct when that happened did get some coverage from those bigger places even if it maybe not be paid as much attention to um so so yeah we're in a weird place with it but what, what do you think about it? do you think that they're just going to do their tuesday 9 a.m here's a direct just yeah. business as usual back to how it always was I, I i'm fairly confident that will be the case i think this is a this is a case of okay we're at you through this year because we have stuff to show off this summer and we're going to put it in the form of a 40 45 minute whatever you want to call it direct mm-hmm. and it will have predominantly stuff for the remainder of the year and then it'll dangle a couple of carrots for further down the line which i think is in their interest to do at this point in time as we've more or less predicted probably not going to include the switch pro but i think it's an important staple that they want to just put their mark in the sand here this summer this is where we are we're nintendo and yeah last year was a little bit of a write-off in many ways especially from a promotional perspective even if they did still put out quite a lot of stuff i think this is them trying to be back again like you know we've got stuff to show off and we want to be here totally uh i think that because they had mentioned i can't remember where i saw this um piece of news but it was saying that nintendo expects to ship more units of switch this year than they did last year and of course that is very fucking difficult with how well switch did last year especially because of animal crossing and so you wonder well how do they push those units when they don't really have much announced um for for this calendar year uh, outside of the stuff they mentioned within that direct and i think that maybe means that there are some big guns coming right um and and that potentially means announcements for what is going to be their big holiday game and you know is there going to be news that breath of the wild does come out this year does that shock everybody and everyone's like oh shit um i i think that they must have things just cooking and waiting to drop and i feel like if they want to hit those big numbers that means that they feel confident in whatever their software lineup is going into the next nine months or so, right? Coming back around to, I guess, 12 months at this point, coming back around to financial year uh, 2022 um, mm, mm, when exactly. that ends. So, so yeah, it's uh, 
it's an interesting uh, place that we're in um, with the industry generally, and I, I'm curious to see just how this summer looks from a content perspective from these publishers and, and what they show everybody. Uh, and hopefully it's a bit more in sync, and, and I think one of the benefits of E3 and having Xbox and Nintendo being involved is like, we kind of have a couple of days to look forward to of like, okay, we're going to get like probably some big news at these mm. events, hopefully. And, um, and is this the first time that you know what we will be experiencing of nintendo e3 will be the same as what the industry experiences because normally the industry go to e3 and will have demos on the show floor and mm-hmm. we've we've talked in the past about like how nintendo don't really do demos at home in the same way for like the industry right well they they did their best buy thing right they partnered with best buy they to did have their best demos. buy thing that was true but like will video game will the industry have any form of nintendo games to play demos of this summer that yeah. we as consumers at home won't be able to and i i would bet no you know right unless they're doing their own events i i don't think so i i mean the only way they would do it is how everyone has been doing it recently which is through parsec parsec is the way that a lot of journalists have been getting access to early game uh capture and like playing games right um they you know stream it directly to the people and they have a pr person there you know watching over them whatever as they go through it um that's the current way of things i imagine is if, that to watch something or to play something or both it's to play something it's to, to play, play something. something parsec is, is used as a way to play uh, remotely like it's it's what if cloud gaming actually worked but it's right. really just it's desktop somehow desktop. i just don't feel nintendo's into that i don't know <laughs> Do you, do yeah, you I'm not sure. I th- I think that maybe they've already done it, actually. Like, I feel like there have been some Nintendo influencers who did get to try stuff out via Parsec. Like um, Paper Mario last year, for example. Did anyone yes. play that ahead of reviews? Yes, I believe previews. But I think what it was in that case was more, we send you the full game, you, your preview can go up to this point in the game, which is what I think sometimes Nintendo tends to do with their games, which is... Okay, so they might do that this summer. That makes sense it depends when games are coming out right yeah. like it, it it all i don't think they're confident in sending stuff out like demo wise you know in a physical form or even in a digital form to people because then that proliferates through the internet and then everyone has access to it which is why i think the closed off ecosystem of something like parsec because you literally can't access it like it's someone giving you the ability to control something on their own machine so you can't do anything to get it off of there right um, yeah so, sounds a bit like stadia in some ways where you click a link to that's what access. i'm saying yeah, yeah it's it's right. it's similar to that but it actually kind of works is the difference okay um but again much more expensive and like different type of use case okay. for that type of stuff but yes um it's possible uh cool well yes i will see what nintendo does at e3 we're getting close now a couple of months uh off so i'm sure we will be chatting a bit more about it when that rears its head bally um we also want to talk a little bit about you know switch pro uh, is definitely another thing i don't think they talk about that at e3 um they never tend to talk about iterative hardware at e3 the only instance that we know of as we kind of chatted about before was the game boy micro when reggie pulled it out of his pocket and it's like hey look at this fucking thing i'm a huge man this is a tiny thing um <laughs> He, he was a good model let's say for the game boy <laughs> yeah. micro to show how fucking small it was uh but yeah th- there's an example of like they announced the 3ds xl literally a month after e3 one year so they just don't tend to do that they don't tend to pair it with that announcement however i do think that a similar thing could happen this year that we get through e3 and then in july they announce switch pro is coming in say september or august right i mean um, or what if they they demo uh, they show off breath of the wild 2 and then it's like I think this looks like it's in 4k how are they uh-huh. doing? <laughs> You're like how are they doing that and then mm, later they say oh yeah it was on it was running on the switch pro it's like that's yes. why it's that crisp yeah totally uh, although that said right like when nintendo demoed breath of the wild originally <laughs> it was still on wii u's so <laughs> even though it was announced to come to switch it was still on wii u's yeah oh boy um so <laughs> You know, I, I don't think that would happen, frankly. They are much more buttoned up than that uh, tends to be the case. So, But we thought it'd be fun to have a little conversation about games we would like to see come to the Switch Pro because, theoretically, it doing 4K, it having a bit more juice to it, hopefully it can uh, handle some games a bit better. Uh, so we put together three games each, uh, maybe have some additional ones as well in case we have any crossover, um, of games we would like to see come to the system. Now, these could be games uh, that are still to come out, that have been announced or games that are already out on other systems uh, that we think would be good fits for switch um and uh, the the new console um so bali do you want to kick us off uh, with your first game you think would be good to come um, to switch pro 
my first pick is one of my favorite games from last year that I think has a lot of Nintendo sensibilities, and that is The Pathless. Yeah, um, I thought you were going to pick this one. It's definitely. Like, it was it was one of those games where I was playing it in 4K60 on my PlayStation 5 thinking, this looks fantastic. I wish it would come to Switch because it. I think fans of games like a breath of the breath of the wild will be very big fans of a game like this it's just very minimalist open world design um just very impressive like i think it's a it's a game that really didn't make enough as many waves as i would have hoped and i was very surprised by some of the reviews um it got but i i genuinely think it's a fantastic game that i'd love to see come to the switch now it might come to the switch anyway and just be very re- low resolution um but i think it's one of those games that could really benefit from a boost on the switch pro it's definitely one where you don't want it to have a low frame rate though right like because of the smoothness of the traversal and like pinging those points and just moving across the world it seems like the smoothness is very much a part of why you enjoy that game right definitely yeah yeah i i I, i'm convinced my favorite style of game for like high resolution frame rate is third person action and this game has a lot of that so yeah as you say it just makes it much more smooth in the environment yeah and it definitely it pings a lot of kind of there's not really any voice acting in it is there like it's like kind of wordless storytelling there right? is actually oh uh, is that the voice okay. acting is funnily enough done by uh troy baker and laura bailey <laughs> oh wow well, well yeah. i mean they're in everything so why yeah. not um okay interesting I, I was gonna say that like hey nintendo they like silent storytelling and don't tend to do a lot of voice acting it's predominantly games, so. silent storytelling don't think yeah, there's these huge sure. long cut scenes that with loads of chat but yeah 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 pathless definitely has like journey vibes to it in some senses as well doesn't it like kind of um big landscapes yeah and it's the the let me get this right it was the creative director of journey i believe believe it's the art director um, who made his own studio and they made abzu and then they made this yeah giant squid Um, they're called giant squid yeah yes yeah yeah yeah. um very cool studio uh you still need to play abzu don't you i do and it's just come as part of the play at home package to playstation 4 but i can play it hopefully well i'll play it on my playstation 5 i don't think it's had any sort of patch as it were but probably yeah abzu i would say if we're talking third person it is the best underwater controls in a video game if we're talking if we're talking 2d ori probably has it but third person underwater abzu is by far the best underwater controls i've played in a video game um so very cool they cracked the they cracked the nut on that i mean they kind of had to when the entire game is underwater if you know what i mean yeah uh, but yes they did a very good job some like there are moments in that game of like swimming through this just like massive like group of fish that is just like stunning stunning stuff in that game so definitely worth checking out um i would say put that on switch but it's already there so uh there you go um it's a good yeah it's a good candidate right because they've already put one of their games on switch and i think this one would be nice on the system but with a bit more juice it would definitely sing right it would be really nice um Cool. Uh, From one Breath of the Wild like to another, uh, my first choice is going to be Genshin Impact. Now, I know that they have said that they plan to bring it to Switch anyway, but frankly, in its current state, the way that it runs on PS4 is pretty fucking garbage, uh, frame rate wise. So I I think bringing it to Switch would be a goddamn nightmare, nightmare, honestly. Um, And I know it's very similar to Breath of the Wild, but this is the difference, right? When you make a game for higher end hardware and then kind of port it down it runs so much worse on switch than if you do custom stuff for switch itself like if genshin had been made for switch i'm sure it would run perfectly and look really nice but it wasn't and i think that would mean that whenever they do a switch version i really need it to be a switch pro edition right now maybe that means that you can still play it on the original switch but it will kind of be like hyrule warriors on 3ds where it runs at like two frames a second you know um there are look there's plenty of those already on the switch store uh so it's not like it would be making much of a splash or a difference um to you know city skylines or whatever other garbage frame rates there are um so uh, Genshin Impact is a game that I think speaks to the Nintendo audience very directly in the fact that it is literally Breath of the Wild in a lot of ways, but actually kind of nails it. And, um, and you know, it has the gacha elements, of course, the scummy microtransaction stuff, which is bad and I will not advocate for whatsoever. But you do get a bunch of free pulls and I got some good characters from it, so I don't need to worry about that stuff really. Um, and it's really weird because it's free to play, but it has a story and like voice acting and like 
stuff that you can actually go on missions and do quests for and, and you can do multiplayer but you don't have to it's it is this really weird idea of a big open world single player game that is just free to play um, and is monetized via weird stuff so uh, i think people would love playing this on switch i would love playing genshin handheld frankly because it is one of those games where you check in with it and you do your little kind of ex exploration and, and do the, your little uh, daily quests and those types of things. Um, and I know it's on phones as well. It's currently, you can play it on your phone. And I try, I got my new phone. I tried downloading it on there, but it ran really badly. Um, so that wasn't uh, a go for me. But I think that the Switch Pro with its boosted juice should give enough uh, impact uh -huh, to mm -hmm. get Genshin Impact on the, uh, on the system running very nicely. Because um, I really think it would do super well. On a Nintendo platform, so, and maybe Bali will try it then. You know, maybe you know, maybe. We'll get, get Bali in. Uh, too much anime for you. you too, know? too much. much. Yeah. Um, my next game is Ken, the Bridge of Spirits. Okay, this I also have this on my list. We so, talked about so. this a lot, I think, previously, but um, it looks like a very cool action adventure, family friendly game that I just think Nintendo need more of these, especially when they're made by th third parties. They need to get these games on Switch. I think that it would sell very well with the nintendo audience and um obviously the switch currently just doesn't have that extra juice that i think a switch pro hopefully would be able to run a game like kenna so you know that game's coming out i think end of july is it i believe august i, I, I think it's that. august end of august yeah end of august so you know i don't know I, i'd love to see that on switch down the line yeah, the thing with it that makes it work on a Nintendo system is that it's basically a Zelda game, or at least it looks like one. We don't really know what it is necessarily so far, but it looks like action-adventure. Um, you're doing some combat, you are solving some puzzles with these little kind of furry guys, and like moving stone statues. Zelda with Pikmin, what more could you want? Totally, yeah, exactly. Like, it's kind of a perfect fit, right, for for, for Nintendo. Like, it's, it's hitting on all the things. And it looks, it just looks really cute and, like, uh, adorable. It's great. Absolutely, yeah. It has a has a great art style to it like ember lab are formerly uh, the guys who founded it you know worked in animation before so mm -hmm. um they clearly have a talent for making very good looking stuff because it looks gorgeous and um i wouldn't think I, I wouldn't want to see it compromised on switch right which is why i don't think it would be a good fit at the moment but if you do get more power then i think that it would be a, a great option there because it is speaking to us in particular as nintendo fans as a game we're looking forward to that we don't know a huge amount about yet but i think just on art style and kind of concept alone it is selling me a, a great deal and i hope it's good that's the thing right this could come out and not be a, a very good game in the end but um i i think from what i've seen of like th there's that shot in the of like the big village and like she's walking through it and it gives me such vibes of like Hateno and like of, of Kakariko, you know, yeah, of, yeah. of those big spaces that you can explore and, um, you know, get around in and, and that type of stuff. So I, I really like that. That's a good choice. Cool. Um, What's your next pick? My next one, it would have been kind of, um, I'm going to go with Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Um, good as I had that my... on my wider list as well okay cool yes i i think that there's a big history of star wars games on nintendo platforms and that's kind of fallen away uh, recently as obviously ea got the license and they were just making mm. stuff that wouldn't run on nintendo platforms and there's a lot of kind of third person action games you know the tomb raider series that i thought would be a good fit but like those games could kind of run on switch as they are at least the first game could because that first game was made for the 360 and the ps3 originally which is kind of where the switch's power level is at so um i thought fallen order was a good one because it's kind of that level but it's a little bit of a step above it right like it is a visual uh, leap um that definitely had a bit of technical issues even on playstation right and i think giving switch a bit more juice and then also them having fixed some of those issues i think in the meantime um would help that you know be more optimized mm. and and run better and look nice handheld and i think it's also one of those games with the metroidvania style to its exploration that suits a nintendo sensibility as well yeah. you know I, I mean i was just gonna say like lots of kids own switches and kids love lightsabers and like yes. ma marrying the two of them up where you can have a proper lightsaber game on the nintendo switch where i'd argue there probably isn't one right now um mm -hmm. would just be a really impressive system seller totally yeah it's um you know star wars yeah, maybe taking a hit in recent times uh you know it's always taking hits star wars but uh it's you, you can't you know fell the giant it's you know it's like 
trying to stab something in its foot and the foot is like bigger than your house you know that's kind of what star wars is. it just doesn't feel it you know it's just going to keep yeah. walking and you can't really do anything about it so um fallen order is a great game uh, and i think it is definitely maybe combat wise um you know maybe a little tricky in terms of difficulty for, for some game, people yeah. um but but I think that, you know, with the way that the Souls games have become popular, you know, Dark Souls is on Switch now, so I don't think it's that foreign right, to, right. to put something like Fallen Order on there. Uh, and I think it would fit very nicely on a new shiny Switch Pro. Um, so that's uh, my second pick. Uh, my third pick is a Square Enix game. And I think that it's one of those series that has just never really been on Nintendo systems that I think the nature of what it's going for would work well to a nintendo audience that is the kingdom hearts series generally. okay um, yes obviously kingdom hearts 3 is the most recent one and that should come to switch um i would i think that game should come to switch uh, i just think that there's probably a lot of disney fans who might only own nintendo systems or likewise this feels like there's a lot of Kingdom Hearts fans out there who have a lot of Nintendo games they're into, but then they'll own a PlayStation just for Kingdom Hearts. Absolutely, and, yeah. Right, and it's just like, there's no reason Kingdom Hearts fans should have to buy a system for that one game when it should yeah. really come to Switch. And it does just seem like Kingdom Hearts 3 just requires a bit more power, a bit more oomph, and yeah a little bit more the, the weird thing is like the collection of all those old kingdom hearts games those could totally come out on switch now i'm surprised they're not already on switch to be honest especially yeah. when they all came to like game pass because there's a lot of collections that came to game pass that also came to switch at similar times and things so i don't know yeah i, I do think kingdom hearts would have a home on switch and doesn't need to be this uh playstation xbox game to be honest totally especially art style wise it fits in you know it's not doing a realistic thing so i think it, it does better on a platform like switch and, and you know yeah. juice wise um but the yeah the third game is definitely the one that i don't think would run that's the one that you kind of need exactly, the, yeah. the boost for um, yeah because the other ones would and like king of hearts has just it's just been on all th these different places like there's a gba game there was the 3ds game right, exactly, and like yeah and so it has a history on nintendo but it's also got a history on mobile and on ps2 and on like all these other yeah. places that it's very are just... like final fantasy in that sense it jumps between systems a lot yeah although kingdom hearts for whatever reason like every single game jumps between a different system versus final <laughs> fantasy that was like it's <laughs> nintendo and then it's kind of switched over to sony with with seven and stuff yeah. like that so yeah a little bit different but um that is definitely a good shout like in terms of fitting the audience it perfectly fits the audience on on switch but it's just a question of mm. i'm really confused as to why they haven't put those collections on there already right like maybe that is a sony deal maybe it's similar to persona where it's like man sure would be good to have this on nintendo but i guess sony has like a kind of I mean, the, contract those collections signed. are on xbox so that's can't, true can't very true exclusive, but yeah you're yeah right. yeah Weird. i i wonder if it's the case of like downporting because they are remakes right and so they have been remade specifically with these newer consoles in mind that said i believe they remade them for ps3 originally anyway so there, there's definitely a way there's i don't really understand why they're, they're not on there yet mm. but i'm sure that that could happen in the future um picking my last one uh i think i'm going to say near automata as my third one um and i think this is one of those games that again doesn't run amazing on current hardware like playstation um and so if you try to put it on switch even though it's not the best looking game like frankly at times near automata kind of looks like a ps2 game um with some of its environments and some of that stuff it's not the prettiest um however i think that handheld would make it really helpful to do some of the side quest stuff that i wasn't really interested in doing it when i was just playing it on the main screen i think it's a game about ideas and about like philosophy and ideology and um and some of that good stuff is supposedly hidden in the side quests, which I never really went after because they felt like they're a little bit grindy and, and not very interesting from a gameplay perspective. But supposedly a lot of interesting story stuff happens there. And so having it handheld, I probably would have been more incentivized to just be like, oh, I'll just run around for a bit and collect these gears or whatever for this guy and then find out what happened. Uh, as it was when I played it, I, I kind of just mainlined it and just went through the entire story. But um, it's a cult classic game and it's the type of thing that i think a switch audience would respond well to um and and is definitely 
handheld wise i don't think would be compromised either with the visual style of the game as i said you know it doesn't it's not actually that impressive and probably could run on a switch as it is but i think the technical stuff that held it back on those other platforms means that it would really not run well at all in its current state on switch so it would have to be given a bit of a juice even if on switch pro it still ran kind of badly at least that would be in line with what the other consoles are anyway you know so so it wouldn't be much of a difference um but uh, especially there's uh, the near replicant the remake coming out of the old game that also you know if they were to put that on switch alongside right. this as like a double pack collection similar to what kingdom hearts When's could the original do original game from uh i think like oh nine or something something like, so 20... like 360 ps3 era yeah it is yeah it's, it's an old game um okay. and uh Yes, I don't know a huge amount about it. I did watch a whole video about it from um, Super Bunny Hop years ago, but I've forgotten most of what that was. And yeah, it's kind of insane. Um, and and yeah, the the sequel is also like unhinged in in many ways, but also very lucid. Uh, once once you've watched a bunch of videos about it that explain what the fuck is actually happening, um, th- then that like I think it's the most respect and appreciation I have got for a game after playing. Because after playing, I was like, okay sure i enjoyed it but i don't see exactly what everyone is super raving about and then like smarter people than me explained it and i was like ah yes this is genius in fact uh so yeah right. um so yeah that's my third one and i think it cool. would fit pretty well um any other kind of bonus ones that you thought would be good Bali, that didn't make the top uh this game's currently tied up with sony but i do think final fantasy 7 remake would yeah be it would be nice one it's one of those point. that i think oh god even it's a really nice looking game. Even I think we may need a struggle. bit more juice. Yeah, I don't know. For sure. And then game, I think like the Don't Nod games maybe or something. I mean, Yeah, I'm kind of confused as to why those aren't on there already, yeah, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Um, like Life is Strange feels like it would suit the platform super well and I they aren't like taxing. I think that's the only one that's tied up with like the Xbox deal, right? But I think the others... Well, tell me why it was on Game Pass, wasn't it? Um, but I don't know if there was any other kind of deal with xbox like yeah. a strange yeah. So, yeah yeah um and something like no man's sky i think might be quite good i don't know just... oh boy yeah I, I, oh, that's another one where i'm like handheld no man's sky just that would be very player. cool again i don't know if it would be able to handle it even with a <laughs> yeah. pro model yeah um, yeah because yeah that's I why tried these running picks that. are at the bottom of my list not the that makes sense yeah. that makes sense uh yeah my other one is persona 5 which i mean oh, i didn't right. include it i didn't include it because frankly original persona 5 could run on the switch right now <laughs> Don't because get your hopes up. <laughs> it was made for ps3 man they released it on <laughs> ps3 there's a version of persona 5 you can buy on ps3 uh that exists so like they totally can just do it on switch but god there must be something going on with that um because that is uh my eternal like i i kind of refuse to replay persona 5 until it comes to switch because i feel like it's an inevitability <laughs> and i just need i need it to happen so i do want to replay it for sure i want to play royal to be honest with you like i was getting it the itch and i was like should i just buy royal it's on sale now for like 25 quid man it's another 100 hours of my life but it's really fucking good 100 hours you know um so yes life choices we make um cool i think that's that's it right um any hopes that any of these will happen Mally? do you think i wonder if kenna has a exclusivity thing with sony that's my only worry um i'm pretty confident the pathless will come to switch i'm just skeptical yeah. how it'll run um and then after that yeah you're right it kind of seems like it's got some sort of sony exclusivity for now at least um but hopefully that will come as well and you know kingdom parts might come i don't know mm. but yeah. i don't know cool uh great well I think that pretty much wraps us up for this episode. Thanks everyone for listening, sticking with us as we chat about the video games. Um, Bally, we have some people to thank for supporting the show and supporting us all the time. Those are our patrons over on patreon.com slash this Nintendo life, uh, where you can head over uh, and support us. And for $1 per month, you can get access to a bunch of bonus episodes uh, that we do where we talk about other video games and other things. Um, and that's fun. Uh, Bally, uh, let's thank some of our patrons. Yes, thank you to our $10 tier patrons. They are Zach S, Atari Alex, Thomas, 
Matthew and my fiance Caroline. Thank you for your support. And yes, thank you to all of our other patrons. Um, it's hugely appreciated for your support. And yeah, go on and check out this non-tender life where we're talking about a ton of non-tender games that we, we've also been playing. Yes, uh, fantastic. Uh, you can also find us in various places all over the interweb internet. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at TNL Podcast. Uh, that's the place you go for all the updates, the things uh, of what's going on with us and the show. You can find me at Lord NBZ, um, where I'm just, you know, I'm just hanging out. I'm not doing much, but I'm hanging out. It's fun times. Bally, where can they find you? I'm on Twitter at Ballyman91. That's B A L Y M A N 91. And I still need to fill out. Still haven't finished that fucking thing you did with all the likes. things. But I'll tell you what, I've got a week off from work this week, and I will complete my 30 video game things that okay. everyone has very kindly liked up to 30 likes so i now okay. have to do 30 things so. great love it i'll hold you to account on that um yes great uh obviously remember we are doing our backlog club on paper mario for the nintendo 64 uh we are both around the end of chapter three at the moment and we are having a great time with it and uh, we'll continue to finish that game up before next time on the show if you are playing along with us um you know send us an email send us uh, your thoughts if you played it in the past as well send us uh, what you think about the game and some interesting anecdotes maybe or some things that you remember uh, that you'd like to bring up uh, in a very detailed deep discussion that we will have about the game next time so send those emails badly to our email address which is this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com and we've also got a channel on our discord server to talk all about uh, paper mario 64 absolutely yeah so check it out get in there uh tell us what you think uh and we'd appreciate all your feedback um that's uh that's it i think well that's the end of the show uh we have um it's sunny right now i don't know if it's going to stay that way there was a day where it was snowing and sunny on the same day i was like is it scotland uh, that happened here yesterday <laughs> yeah well there you go that's scott that's just every day in scotland yeah. um it was it's, snowing uh, and it was very warm and sunny at the same time feels like we're getting towards summer now so and you know tomorrow uh, we're going to be let outside in london um so maybe i'll get a haircut finally and remove this just mop that j- <laughs> dons my head right now it's a it's getting a nightmare in work meetings i'm like i'm a just apologizing for my hair basically because it's just like all over the fucking place um so anyway uh that's my plan you got your camera off yes why are you a camera off just no, no reason yeah no, no i'm just uh, i'm just not we- i'm wearing a hoodie in every meeting for no reason in particular definitely not um, with your hood uh, up yes with the hood up um so anyway uh that is gonna do us for this week thank you everybody for listening we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with some more video games some more podcasting some more nintendo Till then, see you soon. Bye bye, folks. interludes used on today's show were the island music from cozy grove copyright spry fox 2021 and stage one from box boy plus box girl copyright hal laboratory 2019 fucking cool. you know what i could probably run shadow of the tomb Raider at 90 fps and still record and wouldn't have any hitching that's how good this pc is well don't risk it <laughs> Okay, you ready? PC crashes and now you've got all this swagger about you. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Don't worry, my my new, actual new PC will be so powerful that I'll run like three games at once and record and render a video at the same time. It'll be glorious. And okay. mine Bitcoin. Yeah, and mine Bitcoin simultaneously, <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, all right, you ready?